Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the third lecture in our series, Healthy Aging Series, Prepare, Prevent, and Get Proactive. My name is Shannon Echeverry. I'm the director of Silver Club Memory Programs and the interim director of the Turner Senior Wellness Program and assistant director of Geriatrics Community Programs. The Healthy A Aging Series is a collaboration between the four community programs at Michigan Medicine's Turner Geriatrics Clinic, which is Silver Club Memory Programs, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, the Turner African American Services Council, and the Turner Senior Wellness Program. The Turner Geriatrics Clinic, the National Poll on Healthy Aging, the Institute of Healthcare Policy and Innovation at the University of Michigan, and new this year, AARP. Our topic today is brain health, what you should know and what you can do. Um, we are going to be talking today about a lot of topics, including prevention, some risk factors, and research as well. So before we get started, a couple things about Zoom. Um, when using the Zoom webinar, uh, the main thing to know is that questions should all go in the Q&A icon. So you can put your questions there uh, throughout the presentation, and we will address as many questions as we can at the end. While there is a chat icon, please don't use that. Please um, reserve your questions for the Q&A. Please note that we do have a closed caption option for you, you to use if you wish. On your Zoom computer screen, you'll see an icon labeled CC in the meeting controls. You can click on that for closed captions or a live transcript of the presentation. If you have any issues during this presentation, such as your screen freezing up, the best way to alleviate that is to exit and then try to get back into the Zoom. If you continue to have issues, please give us a call at the Turner office at 734-998-9353. This session is going to be recorded, and once it's edited, we're going to update our website, which is mishmed.org slash healthy aging. We're also going to follow up with an email to all the registrants here when the link is available. Uh, please share this with anyone that you think could benefit from the information. Um, also like to call your attention to our next lecture, which is going to be our final lecture in the 2020-23 Healthy Aging Series, which is Friday, October 27th, Navigating Your Medicare Choices and Benefits. So now we are on to today's lecture. We will have about an hour presentation followed by a 30-minute Q&A, and remember to put all your questions into the Q&A. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Edna Rose. Since 2008, Dr. Edna Rose has provided education about the risk factors associated with dementia and the benefits of participating in research to underrepresented communities. She has successfully enhanced minority inclusion in center-supported activities through linkages at local churches, sororities, fraternities, and other social organizations. She is also a nurse clinician that assesses many of the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Center's research participants in the UM Memory and Aging Project. Dr. Rose received her MSW and PhD from Clark Atlanta University in Social Work Planning and Administration and her undergraduate nurse nursing degree from Kennesaw University in Atlanta. Next, we have Scott Roberts. Scott Roberts is a professor of health and health education at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, where he directs the school's public health genetics program and teaches a course on public health ethics. A clinical psychologist by training, Dr. Roberts conducts research on the psychosocial implications of genetic testing for adult onset diseases. He has served since 2001 as co-principal investigator on the NIH-funded REVEAL study, which is risk evaluation and education for Alzheimer's disease. A series of randomized clinical trials examining the impact of genetic susceptibility testing for people at risk for AD. Dr. Roberts has published numerous articles that address participants' motivations and interests in genetic testing, the psychological impact of providing risk disclosure, and health behavior changes prompted by risk assessment. He has also examined ethical and practical issues involved in the returning of research results to individuals enrolled in cancer genetic studies. And lastly, but not least, we have Dr. Donovan Moss. Dr. Uh, Donovan Most is a geriatric psychiatrist and health services researcher. He has two primary areas of research interest. First, he is interested in understanding both the drivers and consequences of potentially inappropriate psychotropic use among old, older adults, focusing on benzodiazepines and antipsychotics. 
In addition, his research explores the factors that drive the potentially inappropriate healthcare utilization of patients with dementia. Dr. Moss earned his medical degree, degree from Johns Hopkins University. He completed his psychi psychiatry residency and geriatric psychiatry fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania with further training in health service research at the University of Michigan. He's an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and a research scientist in the Center for Clinical Management Research of the VA Ann Arbor Healthcare System. So with that being said, I would love to pass it along to um, our first speaker, which is going to be Dr. Roberts. All right, well, thanks, um, Shannon. Are you seeing my slides okay? Yes. Okay, great. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. It's great to have such a, a big crowd uh, online here. Um, so I'm gonna kick us off by talking about dementia and brain health. And um, I'm gonna just start by talking a little bit about the term dementia, which I'm sure you've all heard of, but oftentimes that gets kind of conflated with different specific medical conditions. So just a reminder uh, to folks that when we talk about dementia, it's really just a broad umbrella term that describes this phenomenon of gradual decline over time in people's memory and thinking skills. But there's a lot of different uh, underlying causes of dementia. So you've probably heard of Alzheimer's, the most common type, but there's several other types of dementia as well. Uh, you may have heard of vascular dementia, Lewy body, frontotemporal, et cetera. So I think it's really important when we think about dementia, Ideally, folks would be getting a, a diagnosis that's more specific than that to help understand what's going on so that the condition might be treated. And to make matters even more complicated, sometimes people have uh, both uh, Alzheimer's symptoms and other uh, types of dementia symptoms happening at the same time. So for example, it's very common to have what's called mixed dementia, where maybe you have Alzheimer's pathology in the brain co-occurring with vascular pathology. So I'm gonna talk mostly about Alzheimer's today. I'm part of the Alzheimer's Center and it is the most common type of dementia, but sometimes I'll be talking more broadly about these different types as well. But to focus in on, on Alzheimer's in particular, I mentioned it's the most common type of dementia. You can see from this uh, graphic here, just what a uh, challenge it's gonna be for our society. We are currently uh, estimating that over 6 million adults in the United States currently uh, have Alzheimer's. And you can see the projections are that these numbers are gonna continue to rise dramatically over time unless we can find better ways to prevent or modify uh, the disease. And a lot of this is driven, as you can see from this graph, by the 85 and over group, what we call the oldest old. That's the fastest growing demographic among older adults in the U.S. And so that helps account for why we expect these numbers to increase. And so I think it's really important for us to be talking about brain health. And beyond brain health, I think it's very important for us as a society to be thinking about, you know, how are we going to manage this challenge, thinking about our, our healthcare workforce, uh, et cetera. Um, so I'm gonna talk uh, about risk factors for uh, Alzheimer's and other dementias, uh, because um, I think it's important for us to know what places people at risk. Uh, unfortunately, there are some very important risk factors which we really can't do much about. And so I think even though we're gonna talk today a lot about strategies for brain health, I think it's important to recognize that people can do all the right things and may still develop Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. Uh, age is, uh, as you probably know, the most important risk factor for the disease. So as people get into their 70s and 80s, we see rates of Alzheimer's disease uh, go up. Women are at elevated risk compared to men. So you can see two thirds of Alzheimer's cases are estimated to be women. Women are also disproportionately represented among Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers. So you don't think of Alzheimer's as a women's health issue, but you could make that case given these kinds of numbers. And then um, family history and genetics is a really important risk factor. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, about this because I think people are often interested. They may have you know, a parent or extended family member who's been affected by Alzheimer's and are uh, wondering what does that mean? in terms of their own risk. Um, there are some rare genetic factors that are highly causative of Alzheimer's. So we've known since the 1990s about these very rare mutations that do exist 
Fortunately, they are very rare. They count maybe for like one to 2% of all Alzheimer's cases. But when they are present within a family, you might even see the development of Alzheimer's even in people's 30s and 40s, you know, well earlier than we typically see that. And so uh, it's very important that we uh, recognize uh, in these families, these uh, patterns of disease. You may have read the book Still Alice or seen the Hollywood picture with Julianne Moore. Uh, so that describes a case of early onset Alzheimer's uh, caused by one of these rare uh, genetic factors. And so in these uh, families, the affected parent does have a 50-50 chance of passing that genetic mutation on uh, to their children. And so we do have genetic testing and counseling available in these cases. But again, these are very rare. So most people who have Alzheimer's disease in their family, it's more the later onset uh, form of the disease that's not caused by one of these rare mutations. But I did want to mention uh, this, this kind of case. Uh, the genetic factor that's perhaps more relevant to those later onset cases is known as the ApoE gene. So we all have an ApoE genotype and we inherit one allele from each parent such that you can see uh, on this figure here, we all have one of these ApoE genotypes. And uh, what if you do have what's called this E4 allele, it does put you at higher risk for Alzheimer's. And if you have two copies, so if you have an E4, E4 genotype, you're at even higher risk. And so the general population risk, just to put this in terms of, of numbers, is about 10 to 15 percent chance of developing Alzheimer's in one's lifetime. But you can see if you have one copy of that E4 ApoE allele, it about doubles your risk. And if you have two copies, you may even be at uh, over 50% lifetime risk. So this is an important um, genetic risk factor uh, to be aware of as well. Uh, in the Q&A, maybe we'll even get into uh, its ApoE testing is now being considered uh, when we're thinking about prescribing medications for Alzheimer's because the E4 allele is not just a risk factor for the disease development itself, but is also a risk factor for side effects from some of these new medications that are coming on board to treat the disease. So I think that's uh, it's an important uh, factor to be aware of. On the other hand, uh, having the E4 allele is neither necessary nor sufficient to cause Alzheimer's. So you could have an E4 allele and never get the disease. Or you can also get the disease by having another genotype that doesn't include that E4 allele. Uh, so this kind of testing isn't typically done in medical practice, but interestingly, you may have heard about companies like 23andMe. The FDA did a few years back approve genetic testing direct to consumer. This is kind of a controversial decision, but this kind of testing is available uh, through some direct to consumer uh, genetic testing companies. So I wanted to highlight some of these risk factors that we can't really do much to change, but I think most of our focus today is gonna to be on what can we do to change our potential risk for dementia and maybe enhance our brain health. So let's talk about some of those health behaviors and some of these lifestyle interventions that you might consider or recommend to loved ones that you know who might be concerned about their brain health. Uh, a great resource in this realm is, uh, and I'll try to put after I speak, I'll try to put it in the chat as well. The Alzheimer's Association has a website focused on uh, this campaign that they call 10 Ways to Love Your Brain. And so you can see some of these ideas listed here that I'll get into. I know Dr. Moss is gonna talk a lot about the uh, sleep issues in particular. So the good news is there are things that one can do to help enhance your brain health and potentially reduce your risk of Alzheimer's or other types of dementias. So let's talk uh, about some of these specific examples. And the WHO, you know, the World Health Organization, they put out some guidelines to give us some ideas about what might be done to reduce uh, risk of dementia. You can uh, see they came out with very strong recommend recommendations for these particular behaviors. So enhancing your physical activity, stopping smoking, managing hypertension, diabetes, and cholesterol. And interestingly, they came out against vitamin and supplement use specifically for this purpose of dementia risk reduction. They weren't saying you shouldn't use vitamins or supplements, period, but they were saying there's not enough evidence to support it specifically for the purpose of reducing risk of dementia. 
And then they had more moderate recommendations around, you know, cognitive training. You might have heard that there are some programs out there to help, you know, you, you doing like brain games, keeping your, your mind sharp that way. They also uh, counseled reducing alcohol use and, and managing weight. Now, I think the challenge here is we know from the general population figures that a lot of folks uh, find it very challenging for very good reasons to, to follow these kinds of recommendations. So you can see that uh, you know about 14% of US adults are smokers. Uh, a much higher proportion are obese or have hypertension. So it's a lot easier said than done and we recognize that, but I did wanna kind of put out these general recommendations uh, for you to consider. And we'll try to get into a little bit more detail on just uh, you know, how these might be useful in the realm of brain health. Uh, to kind of follow up on that point about vitamins and supplements, I think part of the reason for the concern in this realm is, you know, there are a lot of products out there uh, in this nutraceutical industry that are maybe making claims that go beyond the evidence. So you, you'll often see them at health food stores where they might say, you know, supports you know, memory function or these kind of vague claims that I, I think have not been highly evaluated. Nutraceuticals are different from pharmaceuticals in that they're not rigorously evaluated by the FDA for their efficacy. So I like to kind of point this out so that people um, aren't kind of purchasing expensive products. That I, My advice is if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And I think this refers not only to nutraceuticals, but some of these other programs you might hear that kind of make very bold promises about brain health. So I think some uh, some dash of skepticism is is perhaps important to keep in mind for some programs that that are these kind of for profit uh, bold claims about brain health. Uh, I mentioned physical activity earlier. I think if we could uh, bottle uh, exercise in a pill form, it would be probably the biggest blockbuster drug ever in medical history because exercise is so important for so many reasons. It is very relevant for brain health because there have been a lot of epidemiological studies that have shown that people who are regular uh, engagers in physical activity do have a lower risk of Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. Uh, and of course, uh, exercise can be good in so many ways. So it can not only uh, enhance our brain functioning. So you can see there have been studies that have looked, for example, at parts of the brain implicated in memory, like the hippocampus, and it shows up on people's ability to complete memory tasks as well. But as you probably know, it can be helpful for our mood. It can be helpful for our well-being. It can be helpful for reducing risk of all kinds of other conditions. So there's a lot of reasons uh, to think about the importance of physical activity. And just as a reminder, you know, the general federal guidelines are, are to have a goal of about, you know, 20 minutes a day if possible. But I think any, anything is better than just being completely sedentary. And so I think trying to kind of figure out for yourself what might be an achievable goal in this realm of, of remaining physically active is, is important. Uh, there's also the importance of being kind of socially and mentally active. So you may have heard of this uh, phrase, use it or lose it when it comes to brain health. And so there's some evidence that social engagement has cognitive and mental health benefits. And I mentioned cognitive training programs earlier. So I think uh, whether, you know, a lot of people think about, well, maybe it's like doing word games or Sudoku puzzles, or I, to me, it's not so much, well, what's the specific activity you engage in, but just trying to be uh, active both mentally and socially is really important. And sometimes, you know, some of these advice uh, we're giving you, you can combine these things. So maybe social engagement could be combined with physical activity by going to a senior center or the Y or things like that. So you might be able to kind of meet these goals, multiple goals at once with, with certain activities. Uh, another slogan that's kind of emerged from the literature is what's good for the heart is good for the brain. So we know that a lot of the risk factors for heart disease that you can see uh, listed here are also risk factors for dementia. And so kind of staying on top of hypertension, high cholesterol, et cetera, I think uh, can have brain health benefits as well. And so there's a big study called the SPRINT MIND trial that showed that kind of management of high blood pressure did have benefits in terms of reducing risk of dementia. Um, diet is really important, of course, too. Uh, that's another realm where kind of intervention can have both cardiac 
benefits and brain health benefits. So the type of diet that's been the most studied uh, in this realm is the Mediterranean diet that you may have heard about, where, which really focuses on increasing fruit and vegetable intake, uh, avoiding kind of highly processed foods, you know, a lot of sugar, fats, et cetera, kind of cooking uh, more healthfully uh, in different ways. And believe me, I know this is a lot easier said than done. I'm from the Philadelphia area, the home of the cheese steak and the soft pretzel, and I'm from a big Italian family, so I know how tempting these, these uh, kind of unhealthy foods can be. But I think if we think again about maybe we could make some start small with some different kinds of substitutions uh, that you can see listed here and kind of tackling this uh, bit by bit and there, th this, uh, these dietary changes might be important to consider as well. Um, I think uh, the, I like to show this slide. This is from the Lancet Commission, which a few years ago commissioned a blue ribbon panel of experts in this area. And so you can see some of the things that they're recommending on the left here we, we've already talked about. Uh, but I wanted to make a couple points related to this. So they're highlighting both some of these individual level changes, but they're also highlighting some things we can think about from a more macro level. So you can see, for example, reduce air pollution. That's something that we have to think about, not just at the individual patient level, but thinking about from the broader social area. And of course, a lot of these individual behaviors could be enhanced if we think about how can we change our built environment or how can we have policies that allow older adults you know, easier access to primary care or, or have kind of easier access to kind of healthy uh, neighborhoods to be able to exercise and walk in. So I think I wanna kind of make that point that we need to be thinking as a society, not just at the individual level, but thinking at the community level, at the, at the structural level, et cetera. Uh, and then also, I think a lot of these things you could, if you look at this kind of middle part of this graphic, you know, the, these uh, recommendations can be beneficial in a couple of different ways. Some of these healthy behaviors may actually have a direct benefit on the brain. So maybe reducing the likelihood that your brain will develop some of these cardinal features of Alzheimer's. Like you may have heard that Alzheimer's, the classic signs uh, in the brain are these amyloid plaques or tau tangles that build up over time. So some of these healthy behaviors that we're talking about may actually be directly relevant to lowering your chances of having these things happen in your brain. Uh, but some of the other uh, health behaviors may not have that direct effect. The effect may be instead at that lower uh, box there of increasing what we call cognitive reserve. So even if your brain does start to develop these amyloid plaques or tau tangles, doing some of these other healthy behaviors maybe enhances your brain's ability to compensate for having those things going on in your brain. So I think just wanted to kind of point out there are different pathways to brain health. We're still learning about this through our, our scientific studies, but I think the end result is a lot of these different behaviors can act in different ways to have the end result of hopefully reducing your chances of developing Alzheimer's or related dementia. And one of these you can see listed here is, is thinking about hearing loss, for example. Uh, there have been some studies that have you know, showed that people who have hearing impairment maybe have a higher likelihood of developing what we call mild cognitive impairment. And so there's this thought that uh, really treating hearing loss might be another piece of the puzzle here to keep in mind. And I, I was always, uh, amazed to see some of the statistics here of just how prevalent this is among older adults. So over 30 million uh, older adults uh, and, and actually adults in general have hearing loss, the majority of whom could benefit from hearing aids. But I've seen this in my own family where a lot of uh, my relatives for a variety of reasons are maybe they're stubborn, maybe there's a stigma involved, but don't necessarily avail themselves of uh, what's out there in terms of uh, being able to improve their hearing. And we know that uh, improving uh, hearing can also lead to better social and mental uh, engagement like we were talking about earlier. Um, so there's been some interesting research studies that are now kind of moving beyond looking at these kind of individual health behaviors and, and changes and trying to think about what about a combined approach? So a lot of this research got its start a few years back uh, overseas in Finland through this major finger study. So they had uh, a really provocative trial where they were trying to combine some of these recommendations. So giving nutritional guidance, exercise training, 
cognitive training, monitoring some of those risk factors that I've talked about for heart disease like hypertension. And they found that this combination approach uh, did seem to have some benefits for the older adults that they followed over several years time. And so we're now seeing uh, efforts in the US to try to replicate and expand on this work. The uh, National Alzheimer's Association has a, a project called the Pointer Study, Pointer Study that's also trying to look at some of these combined approaches. So I think the science is really active in this space. And so I think uh, be on the lookout for maybe more precise guidance over time and a, a clearer sense of or what are going to be the most beneficial approaches in the, this realm of, of lifestyle uh, interventions. So um, I want to be uh, relatively brief here because we have some other great presenters, but hopefully this gives you a flavor of some of the science around brain health, some of the practical tips for what you and your family members might engage in. So I'm gonna close for now and uh, I'll put some of these resources in the chat, but I wanna turn it over uh, to Dr. Most at this point. Hi there, everyone. Let me pull up my slides. There we go. Um, so like Dr. Robert said, um, there are a, a number of things that you can do that can potentially influence your risk of dementia. Um, I'm a geriatric psychiatrist. And like Shannon mentioned in the introduction, I do a lot of work and a lot of thinking um, about medication use and uh, how can we think about sort of maximizing the, the benefit of the medications that people are taking. And so I just wanted to do a little bit of a, uh, uh, go a little bit in depth uh, on that topic, uh, building on some of what Dr. Roberts already presented. So I want to start talking about the National Poll on Healthy Aging. I suspect maybe you might have heard about this if you've attended any of the previous seminars in the session. It's sort of jointly um, conducted by a joint initiative between the University of Michigan and AARP. Um, and this is a poll that we did that was specifically related to brain health and how do people think about brain health and what are they doing to protect their brain health. Um, and it was specifically focused on those in the ages of 50 to 64. So sort of in midlife where there are kind of behaviors that you can be um, uh, practicing that can reduce your risk over the long run. And so it turns out like if you combine the somewhat worried and the very worried, not quite half of adults 50 to 64 were kind of already thinking about and having some concern about the possibility of dementia, which I think isn't really that surprising because uh, it, it's definitely... Um, an, uh, a syndrome and illness that's that's on folks' radars, um, and it's something that most people would like to avoid if they could. So then we also ask some questions to understand what are people actually doing um, to try to prevent dementia. Um, and what we found, just to remind you, actually, before I show you the results, this uh, slide that I borrowed from Dr. Roberts that specifically has recommendations from the World Health Organization, and focusing on that um, strong recommendations, top bullet. Uh, let's see if I can get a pen here. So these right here are the kinds of things where there's the best evidence either to do um, to reduce your risk of dementia or to not do that really doesn't have any evidence of benefit for reducing your risk. Okay, so this is the background. So this is what we know um, uh, about reducing risk of dementia. So then when we actually look at what people are doing, so just to, so this is the percentage of respondents. So the, we go all the way up to 60% of respondents. And what we get are like 30% of people saying that they use fish oil. Um, the, the dark blue bar is people who thought they were very likely or somewhat likely to develop dementia. The light blue bar are people who thought that they were not likely. So regardless, about 30% of people report using fish oil, um, ginkgo's down here around 5%, and then other vitamins and supplements, again, specifically with the idea that they're reducing dementia, um, and, then, and then also crossword, crossword puzzles. So again, what we know from the the evidence we have uh, from lots of different places, including those World Health Organization recommendations, is those are not things that will reduce your risk of dementia. The things that the bullets for reducing your risk, like stopping smoking, like managing your weight, like managing your hypertension, um, your diabetes, 
Um, those are the kinds of things that you would potentially talk about with your doctor and actually very few people have, have done that. And so it seems like there's a real gap between sort of what we know you can do to help reduce your risk of dementia and what people actually say that they're doing to reduce their risk. And so um, Dr. Roberts spent a slide sort of talking about the nutraceuticals and the vitamin supplements specifically related to your memory and cognition. You know, you might as well just throw your money away. There are much better things that you can do with, with those dollars. So if, if we think back to the title of my, the, the subtitle of my talk is like, what, what's in your medicine cabinet that, that can influence your risk of dementia? So there might be some things that you want to add there, specifically when it comes to if you have poorly controlled hypertension, if you have poorly controlled diabetes, these medical, chronic medical conditions that we know can elevate your risk of dementia over time. And if there's any listeners out there who are in the sort of 50 to 65 age group, in particular in midlife, where you have um, many you know, years or decades ahead of you, the, um, it, that's really the time that you really want to start to address it and make sure um, those, those chronic conditions are under control. So then, but the other thing about the medicine cabinet, so in addition to things you're, you're putting in your cabinet, what are some things that you want to take away? So one thing would be sort of um, supplements, vitamins specifically that are related, sort of um, marketed or branded as, as protecting your memory. Okay, so yes, but what else? And so that's what I'll spend the last couple slides talking about are just a couple other things to have on your radar to think about um, whether or not it's a good idea for you to be using these medications. So the place that I'll start is sleep, uh, which is probably the, the main area of concern. So this is another poll, uh, another report from the National Poll on Healthy Aging. Um, I think this might have been either the first or the second one. So it was in the early days of the poll released in fall of 2017. And it was questions about sleep. And so it turns out um, like about a third of respondents reported that at least one to two nights a week they had trouble falling asleep. And then 15% um, uh, said more than three nights a week they had trouble falling asleep. So the, the, the kind of headline of the poll report was trouble sleeping, don't assume it's a normal part of aging. So I added this caveat that in fact, it, it's kind of complicated um, that, that answer for whether or not trouble sleeping is a normal part of aging. So the truth is that your sleep sort of architecture does change with age. So people have a harder time falling asleep the total amount of sleep time at night decreases some. And on average, you have three to four awakenings per night. And so what's the real kicker is that because with age, people sleep more lightly, they're more aware of being awake. So you might not say if you compare yourself at 75 to when you were 55 or 35, you might not be sleeping less you might not be waking up more, but your sleep is lighter. And so you're more aware of the fact that you're having these nighttime awakenings. And so basically you, your perception is that you're more sleep deprived. And so this is all, this is normal. This is not pathological to have changes with sleep as you age. And so that's why it gets a little bit tricky to figure out sort of what is a sleep problem that should require medical attention, intervention, versus what's a normal part of aging. And the reason that's a concern is that people report taking a lot of sleep medications. So not necessarily prescription sleep medications, but one in three older adults report taking something to help them to sleep. Um, they're typically over-the-counter medications, um, and they don't necessarily tell their physicians that they're taking these medications. And so um, here's a, another table of results from that poll where we, on the, this y-axis, we get up to 30% of respondents and we, we broke the groups down by people who, the light gray is people who reported occasional use and the dark gray is people who reported regular use. So you can see about 25% of respondents reported over-the-counter aid use, a bunch of people reported herbal or natural sleep aid use, um, and then a little bit under 10% reported prescription sleep medication use. 
um, and then some who reported actually using their pain medication to help them be able to sleep. So the, the concern here, specifically with sleep medication use, so I'll, I'll talk about the cognitive part here in a second. The main concern with sleep medications is that it increases your risk of a fall. And so that's not that um, surprising. That's something that you take to help you sleep basically means it kind of sedates you a little bit. And so if you wake up in the middle of the night because your back is bothering you or you need to use the restroom and you get out of bed, but you're actually a little bit groggy because of that sleep medication, then that increases your risk of a fall. So if I'm talking to medical students, they might be like, well, oh, what's the big deal if you have a fall? Like, it's not a big deal. The problem is for a 75, 85, 95 year old, a fall can really be a, uh, like a life changing, even catastrophic event. And so you really wanna be very careful about taking anything that's increasing your risk of fall because of how severe the consequences can be of a fall. And sort of across the board, the common thing many of these sleep medications have is that they do um, increase the level of sedation. And so that's increasing the potential risk of a fall. Um, the, the other reason that I'm talking about them today are the cognitive effects of sleep aids. Um, and so if there's nothing else that you remember from this talk, I hope you'll remember this. This is particularly for over-the-counter sleep medications. Most over-the-counter sleep medications include diphenhydramine, uh, which is the generic name for Benadryl. So diphenhydramine or Benadryl is what we call an anticholinergic medication, which blocks. So acetylcholine is a, is a um, neurotransmitter. You have receptors for it all through your body. It plays a very important role in your nervous system and Benadryl blocks that uh, neurotransmitter. And so the side effects of that include constipation and urinary retention, which you know isn't necessarily catastrophic, but can actually cause problems for folks. It dries you out, so your mouth is really dry. In the long run, you can develop cavities. Um, it also impairs cognition um, uh, in the short term, and then, in the long term, with long term use, it is um, there's good evidence that increases your risk of dementia. So that might seem crazy. Like, how is it possible that Tylenol PM increases the risk of dementia? Did he really just say that? And I really did just say that. So there are high quality studies where they've looked at long term exposure to these anticholinergic medications and then your risk of dementia. And so I'm going to remind you, again, diphenhydramine or Benadryl is anticholinergic. And so the, the reason conceptually this makes sense is that in Alzheimer's dementia, people lose neurons. Their neurons that produce acetylcholine in the brain die. And then the medications that have FDA approval to treat dementia, at, at least the not the brand new ones you've heard about in the news, but the ones that have been around longer, uh, since maybe the early 2000s, the most common one is dinepazil or Aricept. So those medications are called acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. They break, they inhibit the breakdown of acetylcholine. So they boost, so these dementia treating medications boost the level of acetylcholine. So conceptually, that hopefully makes sense to people that if you're taking something like Benadryl that's blocking acetylcholine, it makes sense that potentially it increases cognitive problems and in the long run increases your risk of dementia. And so by long run, I mean over years or over decades of regular use of these medications. Uh, but even um, short-term use, again, because of the risk of fall-related injury is just something that I'd be um, mindful of. So then non-prescriptions, uh, excuse me, so prescription sleep medications, there are a number of different classes and there are some newer classes that have come out. Um, but what we know about some that are, have been around on, on the block for a little while is they're just not great. So when you actually look at studies and you look, so these are placebo controlled studies where participants either get basically a sugar pill that they think could be medicine, 
or they get a pill that looks the same and is the actual medicine, there were really very small participants reported very small improvement in their sleep quality when you ask them about how good their sleep was. Overall, their sleep time increased, increased 25 minutes. So that's not nothing, but if you're thinking about like six or seven hours of sleep at night, it's less than half an hour. And then mean nighttime awakenings. So remember, it's normal to have three to four awakenings at night. The, the number of awakenings reduced by not even one. So like a, a half an awakening. So relatively small benefits. And then when they looked at side effects, um, if you got the medication, you were five times more likely to report um, cognitive problems like memory loss, almost four times more likely to report daytime fatigue, and then two and a half times more likely to report to have psychomotor events. So this is what I'm concerned about, the dizziness, the loss of balance. So again, the sort of the risk benefit balance of, of medications for sleep is like really pretty limited. And so I apologize to not have a good message. I'm uh, sharing here an email from between my mom and I over the summer where she was kind of like asking, you know, they've gotten the lecture, like no Tylenol PM. I like look in the medicine cabinets when I go home. Um, and then she was asking me about another medication and I was like, nope, that one's no good either. Um, it was something that she had taken uh, earlier or while she was pregnant. The doctor said, no, it's totally fine. It's totally safe. But um, it is one of these medications. It's a strong antihistamine, strong anticholinergic, has all the same risks of Benadryl. And my mom does not want to do anything that's increasing her risk of dementia. And so that's all she needed to hear. But the again, the bottom line is, is um, in particular for over-the-counter sleep aids to be where. And the truth is there are a lot of things you can do to improve sleep. So the most important thing is to talk to your doctor and make sure you don't actually have a medical reason that is causing you to have poor sleep. Maybe it's untreated pain, maybe it's prostate enlargement, um, maybe it's obstructive sleep apnea. So once you rule out possible medical causes, I'd say the next step is, is behavioral sleep modification. Sleep is a habit. We can get out of habit and we can do things to get us back into good habits. So like not having a big meal before bed, not having stimulants like caffeine or black tea, not taking naps during the day. You wanna build up sleep debt during the day so that then you're ready for bed at night. Um, the, the bed, to train your mind to see the bed as a place for sleep or for marital relations, it's not for bill paying, it's not for watching TV, it's not, having for, it's not for having fraught discussions with your spouse about anything. Um, and so there's lots of sort of sleep hygiene you can do. Um, and in the interest, I'll, I'll wrap it up here, but sort of the, the, the bottom line from my talk is, um, when you think about the prescription medications that you're taking, there's potential for both good and for bad in terms of reducing your risk of dementia and, and cognitive impairment. Um, echoing again, what Dr. Roberts said, don't waste your money on any kind of supplements that are branded as being like memory boosting or, or preventing dementia, because it's just not true. Um, beware of sleep medications, in particular, anything that you can get over the counter. And again, else, please get rid of Tylenol PM if you have it. And that's all. Thanks. And now we're going to uh, go into research. Everything that you've heard so far has been a result of people participating in research. So when we think of research, we think of who needs to be a part of research and why participate. As you can see with the statistics and the information that both uh, uh, our previous presenters, Donovan and Scott, have talked about, these results came as a result of people being involved in research. And so who needs to participate in research? Next uh, slide, please. Okay, one of the reasons you want to participate in research is because you're contributing to the body of knowledge. And what we contribute to the body of knowledge, it benefits society and ourselves. And then when we uh, are part of research, we can determine how we're gonna treat these chronic conditions. Now, both of your previous presenters have talked about the different uh, uh, problems that we have that are related to dementia, the lack of sleep and things of this nature, uh, throat, uh, tossing the Tylenol, 
And all of those things are a result of people finding out that this was a problem and being in research and giving this information to doctors, it added to the body of knowledge. It uh, also determines the cause and effect. And when you become a part of research, it helps us to comprehend the biomarkers or comorbidities, uh, which I'm gonna discuss. Consider the next slide. With the African-American population, oftentimes there we have what we call biomarkers. And we have those biomarkers in place because research has shown that these particular situations present this type of disorder. So oftentimes African-Americans do not have at the beginning Alzheimer's disease, but they have vascular dementia. And now vascular dementia is brought about by hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, and these are all arterial diseases. Now the arteries carry oxygen. So anything that diminishes the amount of oxygen to the brain is considered to be a biomarker. It does not mean that if you have these diagnoses that you will develop Alzheimer's disease. These are just considered some uh, precursors to the disease. If they are controlled, if your medication is stabilized, then there should be no problems. You can go to the next slide. So when we talk about a transport system in the body, specifically to minorities, we're talking about transporting oxygen from the arteries to the brain and to other parts of the body. So when there is a diminished amount of oxygen to the brain and the neurons are not fed with the oxygen and the protein that they need, then this can cause damage to the neurons in the brain. So the hypertension, high cholesterol and diabetes are called biomarkers, especially in minority populations. And with that, act, with that oxygen being carried throughout the system, through the arteries, they become the life support system for the body. Next slide, please. So what is the best time to begin research? Research right now at the University of Michigan and Wayne State and Michigan State, we're taking all ages, anyone 18 years and over, because there are all types of research that are going on. And so what happens is that we have research based on caregivers taking care of someone with Alzheimer's disease. There's research regarding uh, 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 movement disorders. So there's all types of research and oftentimes people will come into research and may need a study partner. Next slide. When they're using a study partner in research, then that person comes with them. They become a part of the research as a partner, but they are not actually in the research. So oftentimes we'll get people at the U of M that are uh, a part of our memory and aging system. And when they come in, they come in with their children if they're over the age of 18, or they come in with their uh, husbands or friends. Now, when you participate in research, it allows you to pursue your interest in the subject matter. Oftentimes we've had family members. When uh, Scott was talking to you about the genetic predisposition and carrying this APOE gene from one generation to the other, this allows you to find out more information about those things that interest you. It, alert, it, it gives you an opportunity to learn something new because oftentimes we have what we call appreciation lunches or we have um, uh, avenues by which we go out and talk to the community in the churches, in the sororities, in the fraternities, anywhere in the community, because we know that people are destroyed because they lack knowledge. So what we're trying to do is give them the knowledge and the opportunity to become a part of research. It allows you to challenge yourself in new ways also. Oftentimes people come into research and they're blown away by some of the testing that's done. They, they didn't realize that it was that easy. They didn't know how the lines connected, how the dots went from one way to the other. But when you're a part of research, it gives you that opportunity to ask questions and to become a part of something that you're giving back to society. It gives you an opportunity to learn cutting edge information. It, it teaches you about the new studies that are there and it updates you on the latest treatments. Next slide, please. So when we go out into the community and as of to date, uh, we have spoken at over four or 500 churches in the Detroit metro area. We are able to go out to churches and the community. We talk about some of the same issues uh, that, that, that Scott and Donovan have spoken about. It gives you an opportunity to ask questions. And when you participate in research, you, you learn about all the different medication trials that are present, the biomarkers, the memory training studies, the lifestyle interventions, some of which were uh, mentioned today, the caregiving studies and more. And so we ask people to sign up. 
Now, we also have inclusion and exclusion criteria. When we talk about inclusion criteria, it may be that you're the right age for this particular research project, or your biomarkers may uh, point you into a direction where we're studying those that have hypertension, diabetes, or high cholesterol. Then we have the exclusion criteria, which means there are some uh, research projects where if you've had a stroke, you may not be able to be a part of, or if there's a research project where we need to perform an MRI, and that's that magnetic, magnetic renaissance imaging, and let's say that you've had a a plate or you've had tattoos, well, you may not be able to be involved in that research project because that's an exclusion criteria because you would not be able to have an MRI done. So we have the inclusion and exclusion criteria. We also have the educational component where we're able to come out and talk with you, your organization. Uh, and when we do this, then people learn more about what's available and how to go about uh, getting into research with us. So we do have the mindset registry here at the um, University of Michigan. Uh, we're actively recruiting research uh, for all different types of studies. Right now, we have over 20 research study projects that are going on. And because we are affiliated with Wayne State and Michigan State, there are times that they're involved also. So what we're trying to do is get people to understand that participating in research will allow you to add to the body of knowledge. You may not receive um, the benefits of the research that you're participating in, but others around you and for future generations, you'll know that you've had a part. And so when we talk about uh, the lack of knowledge, what we do is when we come, we have more time than we do today to take your questions, to discuss with you what's going on. And so there is a number that's uh, located at the bottom of this slide, the 734, the 936, 8803, and I'll also put that in the chat. But if you call that number, we have people that will take your information. It's just a brief questionnaire. And from that questionnaire, they can point you in the direction where your research can be uh, began. Oftentimes, people are really excited about being in research because what we do with research, oftentimes the person comes back every year. Now, there's no insurance company that's going to pay for neuropsychological testing every year, but just as you have your eyes checked, just as you have a history and physical every year, sometimes being in research allows you to have a neuropsychological exam each year if, in fact, you are uh, designated in your research project that you participate in to have that done. Oftentimes, too, uh, graduate students are trying to find answers to questions. And most of our research is ob observational, but there are times that questionnaires are just sent out just to ask you information that can give them the, inf the, the, the knowledge that they need to pursue the degree that they're looking for. And also by doing that, they're adding to the body of knowledge. That next screen, please. So this is how we get involved. We have Kate Hansen and her information is listed there and you can, uh, and I'll put that in the chat room for you afterwards, but this is a team. We have research assistants that perform a lot of the neuropsychological testing. We have a lot of educators and Scott and myself, we, uh, Scott actually goes out, we come to Detroit, we come to the surrounding areas and we have different topics that we discuss. Every month, we have a different topic that's discussed, and oftentimes, those topics that we discussed are presented to us by the people that we're giving the information to. And so we'd love to have you come on board for research. It's really interesting. Uh, you gain a lot of knowledge, but above all things, the information, all of the information that Scott and Donovan have given to you today is based on research. It's based on people coming in, giving their time, becoming a part of research so that what they too can add to the body of knowledge. I'm I'm going to turn it back over to our moderator, Shannon, and now we'll have our question and answer session. Thank you so much. All right, that was extremely informative, and we have many questions of, that people gave us uh, prior to when they registered, and then also a lot of questions that came up. So we do have about 35 minutes, so I'll try to get to as many as possible. Uh, but we likely won't be able to get to all of them. So please, if your question, uh, we weren't able to address your question, we do have an email address, healthyagingseries at umich.edu. Also, as a gentle reminder, we will be sending out uh, the recording once we have it available in about a week or so, along with any slides that, that the presenters will share with us and some of the links that have been shared in the Q&A as well. So let's go ahead and get started. Lots of wonderful questions here. Um, so we have a lot of questions about medications. Um, 
And one of, and some of them about sleep, Dr. Moss, that you were talking about. So someone had a, uh, Mary had a specific question about melatonin. Um, are there increased risks of dementia with that medication? Yeah, I saw a bunch of questions about melatonin. So um, I'm, I'm not aware of there being any evidence or sort of a conceptual reason why melatonin would increase risk of dementia. Um, I'd say where melatonin maybe makes the most sense for use is particularly, so melatonin is sort of helps regulate your body cycle. So in a case of like travel across multiple time zones, or if you have what's like a circadian rhythm disorder where sleep wake is off is probably where maybe it makes the most sense to use melatonin. Um, I know lots of people use it. I think probably the use is more than there's really evidence to support the use per but I'm less concerned about fall risk with it. I'm really not concerned about an increasing risk of dementia. Thank you. So Terrence had the question um, to get a clarification about, can you define the long-term use of Benadryl and are other antihistamines also a potential problem? Another good question. So the, the studies that have specifically linked, so again, it's use of these anticholinergic medications um, with increasing risk of dementia have looked at sort of consistent use over years, you know, up to one year, one to five years, five to 10 years. So I'm not talking like a week or two at a time type of use. So if, you know, you have terrible seasonal allergies and you need to use some Benadryl for like a short term period of time, um, that would be reasonable. It's just the type of thing to not make it a habit month over month, year over year that you're using it consistently, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, also related to sleep, um, people are asking a couple questions about snacks. So what snacks that anyone may recommend would be a healthy choice before bed? What about uh, the skinny pop, popcorn? Yeah, I like that. I like skinny pop as a choice. I don't have a great answer other than maybe like, you know, some of the the dietary rules that Scott went over probably also apply for good snacking choices as well. You know, in general, avoiding processed foods, you know, maybe a small quantity of almonds, something like that. Um, yeah, I'd say general rules of your diet would apply to you, to a snack at any time of day in particular uh, before bedtime, mainly just have it be something relatively healthy and also relatively small. Perfect. So segueing into the diet conversation. So I would, I would love to hear from anyone or from multiple of you, what your thought is on this. So we discussed the Mediterranean diet um, and Linnell had the question about how does the Mediterranean diet compare with the keto diet in terms of health benefits? So the Mediterranean uh, diet recommends low fats and keto is a recommendation of higher fat. So 70% of diet. I don't know the answer to that question directly because I'm not as familiar with the literature on the on the keto diet. I guess I, I highlighted the Mediterranean diet because I feel like that has been the the best studied in the context of benefits for both heart health and brain health. And I think um, so that's part of my reasons for prioritizing that. But that's not to say that you know there are other approaches to dietary changes that I think can be useful that aren't kind of specifically the Mediterranean diet. So I think it's not to say it's the only path forward, but it, it does happen to be, I think, the approach where we just have the best uh, science behind it at this point. So um, it, it'll be interesting to see if some of these other uh, dietary approaches also uh, garner evidence as well. So sorry, I can't speak directly to the direct keto versus Mediterranean <laughs> comparison, but hopefully that uh, helps clarify some of why I was highlighting the Mediterranean diet. Thank you. And would um, would you recommend that if people have specific diet questions to talk to a dietitian or, or someone that studies that specifically, or what do you suggest for that? Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I'm, I'm not a 
practicing clinician anymore. So I defer to Donovan and Edna as well in terms of if they have specific recommendations in terms of like nutritional counseling or, or dietetics uh, here in, in Michigan. There was a time that we had a registered dietitian on board with us and believe it or not, she was, um, her concerns were the low fat because of the uh, biomarkers in the African-American population. And so I'm sure that if you go to a dietitian or you go to your medical doctor, he would probably suggest if you have any of those biomarkers that we were speaking of, that low fat diet as opposed to a high fat diet. But like I'm saying, there are other underlying causes or underlying diagnosis that we just can't address because we don't know the history of the individual that might be asking. Thank you. So there are a lot of questions, and I get this question a lot in my work as well, about the efficacy of brain games. So one, one person, when they registered, they were, or they were asking about, um, do specific mental exercises such as crossword puzzles generate generalize to other cognitive abilities? Another person asks a similar question. Um, is it actually help helping your cognitive functioning or is it just making you really good at doing crossword puddle, puzzles or Wordle? Um, and there is sort of a second part of that question. If, if you do believe that those things are helpful, if you're aware of any uh, games or resources of where people can find these. Yeah, I can take a, a first step at that. I'm sure other panelists may want to add on. Yeah, so I think you know there is the reason why cognitive training made it into those like WHO recommendations is there is uh, literature to suggest that it, that it can cognitive training or these brain games can, and of course it can take a, a variety of different forms, but they they have demonstrated benefits in terms of you know some just key domains of cognition, whether it's memory or executive functioning or or other you know, domains of memory and thinking. I think uh, the challenge is that, you know, a lot of times these effects might go away if you don't sustain the specific cognitive training program. And I think my other kind of caveat here too is that a lot of these things, there are these kind of commercial programs out there that can be you know, pretty expensive uh, but you can still get the benefit from your own self-designed kind of program. It doesn't have to be kind of a fancy computerized brain app. Um, you know, we can we can all kind of think about mentally stimulating activities that we can partake in for free. Um, and so I think there is some suggestion if that if you're doing things that maybe are kind of new skills like learning a new language, or I, I saw in the chat somebody, you know, a ballroom dancing class. I like the ballroom dancing example because that's kind of you get kind of bang multiple bangs for your buck in terms of it's not just like a new skill that is mentally challenging, but it's physically uh, getting some activity and it's also social. So you're kind of hitting multiple buckets at once. So maybe thinking about in, in terms of activities that you might choose that you might combine, not just the brain game piece, but can you add a social piece to it. And then just also thinking about what's going to be sustainable over time. If you're really doing it just out of the sense of, oh, I, I really like, it's like homework to do to, to reduce my chance of dementia. And it's really not kind of intrinsically motivated that the chances are that you might start uh, and then give up pretty quickly. But if you're, if you have a passion for these things, yeah, I'm a total wordle and spelling bee and all the New York times. Uh, stuff, you know, addict. And so I, I there's going to be no problem for me to sustain that over time. So kind of thinking uh, in terms of what, what might you be able to sustain over time, what might not cost an arm and a leg, and what might be able to allow you to combine the mental stimulation with some of the social piece would be some of my suggestions. And I think you go back, Scott, to what you said about if you don't use it, you begin to lose it. So I think that stimulation of the brain, you know, sometimes uh, people can become potato couches and that's one way that you can get up and physically exercise with the ballroom dancing, but stimulate your mind with the uh, with the games that you play. And so um, I think anything is better than nothing. So doing something to keep yourself together is better. Perfect, thank you. So a question that that I have, uh, because I know we talked about lifestyle interventions, how people can prevent dementia in different ways. Obviously, that's not foolproof, but something that would certainly help. What about for people that are watching now that either 
themselves are diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment or a type of dementia, or they know somebody who has dementia. How, how important are those factors in preventing further cognitive decline? Yeah, I think a lot of the advice we're giving would apply to someone who's been formally diagnosed with, with cognitive impairment. I think I think about physical activity, for example, being one great example. And I think you know the goal might be a little bit different. The goal might be rather than I want to prevent you know the onset of a condition, it's more I want to kind of maintain functioning for as long as possible. Uh, but even so, I think so, a lot of these uh, recommendations would still be applicable. And can and like we've talked about, a lot of these behaviors have broader physical health benefits for other issues and have a lot of kind of just mental health and well-being benefits. So uh, the, there's kind of multiple reasons to engage in these kinds of behaviors. Yes, and yeah. I think it goes, I think it goes back to uh, a previous session um, that we had talking about the importance of social connection. And I just think about how all these different lifestyle interventions, how many of these are things that can help prevent other diseases and conditions and help with a healthy life. So I think all those together, that that's all great advice. Okay. Was someone else going to mention something? Yeah, I was, I was basically just going to echo what Scott said, you know, a general rule of thumb again, echoing him is, you know, encouraging people for activity in three domains, social, intellectual, and physical. And that really, frankly, for anyone of any age, um, any most levels of cognition, that's a, a good rule of thumb um, for as a way to kind of approach and think about well-being. Um, again, something that Scott touched on was really thinking uh, and Edna thinking about in particular cardiovascular disease, managing cardiovascular risk factors, because we know for sort of multiple types of dementia, um, that seems to be on the pathway uh, to developing it. And so the extent to which you can manage um, your hypertension, your cholesterol, diabetes, which can contrib contribute to vascular disease, um, again, is important both for preventing dementia, but also um, thinking about um, not having it progress by, by keeping those chronic medical conditions that we know are part of the, the risk picture. Thank you. So I know this was touched upon in the presentation about the connection between hearing loss and developing dementia. Um, can we get some expansion on that of why hearing loss and dementia are so, so interconnected? I mean, I think we're still learning. And I think the when I showed the graphic, I think it was from the Lancet group. I think it was it was linking the hearing loss, not so much that it's directly related to Alzheimer's pathology in particular. So, you know, the amyloid plaques and the tau tangles in the brain. Uh, so it wasn't so much that that if you have hearing loss, that though that kind of neuropathology is going to occur, but more it might affect people's ability to cope in the face of those kinds of neuropathology symptoms. And so uh, it might increase what's called cognitive reserve, this idea of the ability to kind of even if your brain is, is starting to develop some of these issues that you're, you're able to still function well, um, you know, and I think. And just practically, of course, it allows you to maybe be able to more meaningfully take part in a whole range of activities and social life. And so I think that was the the importance. But there have been studies that have, I, I think I cited one from the University of Wisconsin, where they followed people with hearing loss longitudinally over time and did find that hearing loss did seem to be a risk factor for uh, ultimate cognitive impairment, not specific to Alzheimer's, but just cognitive impairment more generally. And um, Joshua Ehrlich, who's an ophthalmologist here at the university, has actually done sort of similar work looking at uncorrected visual impairment, um, also increasing increasing risk of dementia. Um, and it's it's interesting to think about you know the way possibly say a, a, a brain is handling sensory input. You know, if I think about when I uh, get out of the car and my glasses fog up. 
how difficult it is to navigate the world. If, if you think about, you know, this critical information that our brains are getting either from what we're hearing or what we're seeing, and if that is sort of clouded or obscured in any way, how much harder your brain has to work to manage and make sense of the world around you, I think it kind of makes sense how these kinds of sensory impairment might make it difficult to maintain that cognitive reserve to be able to sort of go through the world, making sense of everything and putting it all together. Um, so do, you know, uh, um, you want to um, talk to your relatives, perhaps reluctant relatives about having their hearing checked and corrected and, you know, making sure fortunately in the U.S., uncorrected vision isn't that common, but it definitely is out there. And so, you, you know, you want to go through the world as best able to navigate and manage everything that's happening around you as possible. And so that means good vision and good hearing. Yes. And Johanna actually had a question quite related to that. So her question was specifically about, are you aware of any studies on a connection between macular degeneration and the relationship to brain health? Not off the top of my head, but it's for the reasons Donovan was just outlining, it wouldn't surprise me if there was some kind of potential link there, but I'm not aware of any specific studies in that realm. Thank you. So this next one is for Dr. Rose. Um, is there a geographic area for volunteers for studies and do studies offer a participation stipend? Yes, we do. Um, we're here at the, uh, in fact, today, I'm here at the University of Michigan in Detroit, which is on Woodward Avenue. And so we're downtown Detroit. So though we may recruit in all areas, we have the Ann Arbor office where people come, and we also have the Detroit Center. Uh, there is a stipend that's given, and that's different based on what uh, project you're in. There are some that pay very minimum. There are some that really pay over the top. And so uh, oftentimes, too, it may require that you come more times or that you have uh, an MRI that's associated with it. And so everything that you do, uh, uh, giving blood samples, there's a fee for that. Doing an MRI, there's a fee for that. Uh, just coming in for us to do the neuropsychological testing, there's a fee for that. And so uh, and we are here in Detroit and we are in Ann Arbor. So we try and go both places. However, if there's an MRI that needs to be done, we do have to go to the University of Michigan to have that done because they want all MRIs done on the same machine. And so there is a stipend that's given. And, um, and like I'm saying, the benefit um, usually outweighs the stipend because uh, there's no, your insurance doesn't pay for the neuropsychological exam until you go to a doctor and you refer to a neurologist. And then that means that something is wrong. And so, you know, there's some, um, uh, when we go out to talk to people, we talk about the legalities behind uh, coming into research because of the anonymity that's there, as opposed to going to a doctor's office, because now it's going to become a part of your medical record. Uh, when you do come into research, um, we don't transfer those forms to anyone else. You can elect to have that done, but we don't do it. And so, therefore, um, it's sometimes better to come in and then uh, oftentimes people find out there's a problem and then they go back to their primary care physician and then they're referred to a neurologist because we don't treat people. We just do the research. And, uh, and that's why I push research so much uh, simply because it, it, it helps to educate the client. And so oftentimes when we've gone out and Scott is over our outreach and recruitment segment at the U of M. And when we go out to talk with individuals, once the knowledge is gained, then people have a desire to become a part because they realize that the benefit not, is not only for adding to the, to the knowledge base, but it's information about themselves. And so, yes, there is a stipend that's paid uh, when they come in for research. And in, during the consenting, they give you that information. They tell you how that will be paid, when that will be paid, and things of that nature. Thank you for those clarifications. Yeah, I can just add on to what Edna's saying. I, I put in the chat a couple links if people are interested in research studies. So one of the links I put um, was... Uh, to, to our Alzheimer's Center, where we have, that's the, Edna was referring to the over 20 studies specifically focused on, on dementia research. But then I also put the university has a broader U of M health research portal. Um, so I'm, this group may have interest beyond just uh, Alzheimer's research. So I wanted to also put that link. And, and uh, yeah, so I think, and also 
the stipend may, as Edna was pointing out, depend on the study. Our, our flagship project is called our uh, UMMAP, University of Michigan Memory and Aging Project. So that one, we definitely do have a stipend. It's an annual visit. And it, we also have a stipend for what we call our study partners, because sometimes we uh, co-enroll. If the person has memory loss, we co-enroll, you know, like a, a family member as well. And I think sometimes these studies will not just, it's not just about financial benefit, but sometimes certain studies might give you back your individual research results. Like, how did you do on the memory test? A lot of people are curious. And so we try where possible to give that kind of information back as well. It's not financial payment, but it's hopefully a way of paying people back for their participation by giving them information that they or their family members find useful about themselves. Thank you. Another theme that I'm seeing in the questions is around quote unquote healthy aging. Um, so if I would like to hear your different perspectives on kind of what, what people can be looking out for if what they may be experiencing is normal aging versus that there may be some kind of an issue that they should get addressed. Usually, oftentimes it's the family member or close friends that notice something is out of the um, out of the normal for the individual. Because what I would say would, would be normal for one individual may not be normal for another individual. Uh, you have some people that come into research and they've always forgotten people's names. That's been there since they were in high school. But for another person, that could be abnormal because they always did remember people's names. And so uh, healthy aging is different things to actually different people, but it depends on where you start out. Uh, I think I think Scott or uh, Donovan said something about people exercising over a period of time. And then there's some people that are just getting on that train a little bit later. They just started exercising at 55 or 60. And we were presenting at one facility and the age of the group that we were talking to was about 65, 75. And then they came back and said, well, now the information you're giving us, we needed that. Uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And so we're finding out that, especially with the African-American population, that some of those biomarkers that we were talking about, the, uh, the, uh, the hypertension, it's untreated because it just wasn't treated. I mean, and oftentimes uh, we had a um, male today that made the statement that one of the reasons he came off the hypertension medication because of the sexual dysfunction. Well, he never really thought to go back and talk to the doctor to see if he could get that straightened out. So therefore he never took the hypertensive medication. So oftentimes we do need to dip back a couple of, you know, 10 or 20 years to try and bring people up so that when they get to that aging system, when they get to be 70 or 75, then these problems won't exist. But if we don't catch it, at, at, at 30 or 35, changing the habit, uh, decreasing the salt, watching those condiments, things of that nature. Sometimes people have, have not been able to put that together, that this, you know, the, the, the cause to the effect. When we go out to talk to them about it and they have the uh, opportunity to ask individual questions, then that's when you actually get to the bottom of it. But um, I never really thought when um, churches were asking us to come out and the population was like 65 plus, because that's the age group that we were looking for, that we needed to go back to 35 and 40 to see if we can help them through education to prepare themselves so that they won't have these biomarkers as they age. You see what I'm saying? So uh, we're not, and, and oftentimes we have to tell them, we're not saying because you have the high blood pressure the diabetes, that you're going to have Alzheimer's. That's not what we're saying. But we do know that there's an association between that and vascular dementia. And so uh, I think I may have forgotten to mention too that this is why we need all ethnicities in research because we need to understand why things are different with one population as opposed to another population. Uh, Caucasians have a, a somewhat high cholesterol level, but African-Americans have the strokes. So, so you're trying to see what, why, why are these differences there? And the only way that you're going to be able to do that is to include everybody in research. And so the, there's been some disparities and African-Americans have not always come into research because of our own, uh, you know, certain things like the um, Tuskegee. Story. And so when we go out to talk, we open up and, and, and discuss that first. And we, then we talk about the IRB and how things have changed over a period of time because the lack of participation by minorities in research doesn't give them enough to go by when you open up a circular for medication and you look at the demographics and you see that you were not included. That's why that story has to be told. And the only way that that story can be told is if people come into research from all different populations so that we can see and compare and try and figure out why this thing is attacking one, uh, you know, in the 70s when we first started looking at Alzheimer's disease, 
mostly Jewish people have the disease. And now African-Americans are number one for the diagnosis. So you're asking yourself the question, is it just from a, um, a biomarker that's associated with physical capabilities? Or are there some social factors? Are there some dietary factors that are there? And so those are the things that you get to when people come into research, because now you can begin to make some comparative analysis as to why things are the way that they are. And so that's one of the reasons um, working with Scott, Scott, I love to go out and do the recruitment because that's the educational component. Because if we educate correctly, then research, uh, we will have the populations that we need in research. And just sorry, I can't speak Spanish because that's another population that we need to reach and we don't have enough Spanish speaking um, uh, 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 employees that can go out with us to, to speak, but we're, but we're getting there, we're getting there. Yeah, we do. We just got a supplement to have a new outreach program in the Grand Rapids area. Irving Vega uh, is one of our colleagues. So we will be uh, doing expansion with uh, Hispanic Latino participants, uh, at least in the western part of the state moving forward. But it's a great question that we get a lot, like what's normal aging versus what is really a concerning sign of potential dementia? So I I, I posted again in the chat just now, the Alzheimer's Association has this great resource called the 10 warning signs that might give people a little bit more information. But I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, how frequent are these concerning things happening and, and how much does it really affect people's functioning? So, you know, forgetting somebody's name at a party is one thing or occasionally losing your keys is, you know, these things happen to all of us. But if it's, you know, kind of the frequency, the severity, and is it really impairing people's ability to, to work, to socialize, to enjoy life, that functional piece is often helps give us a clue as to, well, well maybe this is something that uh, should be checked out. But I think a lot of times people do, and, and professionals too, also maybe write things off and they say, oh, that's just, that happens to all of us because it's kind of more comforting to think about that way. So we I think we do need to, try to think about recognizing when somebody might warrant kind of a more thorough uh, assessment to really kind of get to the, the bottom of what's happening. And, and when their memory impairment has began to affect their activities of daily living, uh, that's when you began, began to see signs like forgetting to pay their bills on a regular basis, you know, uh, uh, driving and becoming disoriented and a little confused, having to, you know, go to, so that's why when uh, participants come into research, that's why we're asking those questions. Has there, has there been a disorientation? Uh, when you go out to eat, can you pay your bills? Are you still able to get the percentages right? Just simple things like that. And that's one of the reasons that uh, most of the studies that we're in, they require a, a study partner because sometimes the individual may not think it a problem when the individual that stays with them or sees them on a regular basis can see the changes that are taking place. Thank you so much. So I'm seeing some questions about resources and I know that we've been you know, sharing some links in the chat and some other information. Um, just, just briefly to share for those of you who may be local to Washtenaw County, or even if you're not, the, the Turner uh, Geriatrics Community Programs, we have numerous programs that work on overall health and well-being for older adults. We have exercise classes, we have um, lunch groups, we have um, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute is a volunteer um, organization that does a lot of programming, um, Silver Club Memory Programs has an adult day center for people with dementia and also some mild memory loss programs as well. Um, but also just more generally, I think if you're not local, um, your local area agency and aging should have a lot of resources um, in terms of those uh, types of supports, as well as the Alzheimer's Association, um, the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Center also has some different social and support programs. Does anyone want to add any kind of general programs for health well-being that may help people stay cognitively healthy for longer? Laura Oshinger, one of our staff, has a program. I think it's called Mind is it Mindfulness, Scott, uh, that Laura does. And it's it's a really good program. And I think it not only um, offers help for the person with cognitive impairment, but for also. And so there are a lot of because uh, if you're the, you know, if, if you're a caregiver, then there are some stressors that you're under, too, and you need a little relief there. And so um, she does a lot of things uh, like that. Yeah, that's a great point. And so our. Um... Our center has a, Laura leads what's called our wellness initiative. So we have a variety of programs. A lot of it is 
geared around caregivers and helping them deal with with stress. Uh, we have some support groups as well. We have some support groups specifically for Lewy body dementia caregivers, because that's a condition that has distinct issues. And a lot of times Alzheimer's gets most of the attention. So we try to um, also offer some programming that's maybe sp more specific to, to different uh, types of dementia. Uh, I mentioned the Alzheimer's Association. They sponsor a lot of kind of education and support programming. So our Michigan chapter of the Alzheimer's Association is a great resource. Uh, there's a lot of clinical programs. I think Donovan posted in the chat, you know, some of the like a sleep disorders program. He's a, you know, geriatric psychiatrist. There's a geriatric psychiatry program. We have a cognitive disorders clinic. So there's a lot of kind of specialty medical care programming at Michigan that might be relevant. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of resources. I know it can get confusing to kind of navigate. And so I think that's great that, that I think through programs like this, hopefully uh, we can get people pointed in the, in the right direction. I don't know, Donna, if you want to add more from your group, what, what programs you have. And uh, uh, Scott, don't forget our quarterly uh, presentations here in Detroit and in Ann Arbor uh, that we put on and they're different topics and those are actually open to the public. They're kind of like a lunch and learn. They last a couple of hours. They have them in Ann Arbor. They have them here at the Detroit Center and invitations are actually contact information that Scott has placed. Uh, you can get on a mailing list and receive the uh, an electronic mailing list as to the things that are going on. Dr. Moss, anything to add? No, it's, it's a pleasure to go after Scott and Edna because they cover all the bases. I don't have to say anything. And if anybody, we do at the Turner Center, we do care consultations as well, and we have a lot of resources. So if there's anybody that just wants to a little bit of direction of, of where to go for these types of things, that we're a good resource for that as well. Um, so we've only got a couple more minutes here. Um, we're getting short on time. Um, so I think this question I've seen a few times about, and this topic, I think we could probably go on for much longer than we have, but any kind of thoughts about medications that are on the market to prevent cognitive decline once people are diagnosed with dementia? I know that's a controversial, complicated topic, but anyone that wants to take a stab at that. Um, so there, there are FDA approved medications for dementia, not the brand new ones, but the older ones that have been now around for several decades, most commonly Aricept or Dinepazil is the generic name, uh, which is for more mild to moderate. And then Memantine or Nemenda, which is for more moderate to severe. Um, I would say that the, the benefits are small if present at all. And the important thing, the difficult thing to keep in mind is that people don't improve. So in this sense, benefit means that the rate of decline is slower for some people. And the really difficult thing is sort of, you, you don't know what it would have been otherwise. Um, so I would say it's largely up to the clinician that you see, whether they're a person that uses these medications, and it's largely up to the preferences of the family and the patient, whether or not they are interested in these medications. Um, I don't think that there's a clear right answer. The place, I saw a question in the chat, in particular, these the Aricept family of medications um, can suppress, app, they can cause nausea, and can cause possible weight loss. And so for patients in particular who are thin, who are maybe really borderline, you're concerned about how small they are, how thin they are, losing weight, um, you would be particularly concerned about the medications possibly even contributing more to weight loss. So it's just a very murky, I'd say patient-specific decision whether or not they're the right thing. Um, but really, really limited benefit. Dr. Rose, Dr. Roberts, any final thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I guess I, I agree. I get uh, there is a lot of activity though in this space, so it will be interesting to see moving forward. You know, we do have this Lakembi people may have heard of was just approved this year as a new treatment for Alzheimer's. There's one called Denanamab that will likely be approved relatively soon. So I think we're fortunately in a time where I think the treatment options are starting to expand after many years of having zero FDA approved medications. Uh, but, the, you know, the, like Donovan is saying, I think a lot of it is really kind of up to the patient, the family and the clinician weighing the pros and cons. None of these are kind of slam dunk. It's going to stop the disease in its tracks. Uh, so it's it's certainly worth, I think, exploring. Um, and there's you know a lot of activity in this space. So I imagine our, our, these discussions will be evolving uh, rapidly over time. Thank you. Rose, any final comments? No final comments other than, like I'm saying, it's an individual matter on the medication because you'll find some people that said that it didn't change them. And I think the expectations of the caregiver for the medication is somewhat, uh, oftentimes there's a letdown for that. And I think someone had had in the chat about the 90 year old that was 125 pounds. And I think that's what Donovan was saying. That's gonna have to be between them and the clinician. Or would you want to give someone a medication that can cause weight uh, loss? Also, the newer medication, one of the ones that, are, that we're waiting for the FDA approval on, um, initially it was only going to be given to those people who were in research. The cost, they got the cost now, but the cost is still somewhat high unless you have all the different parts of Medicare. And so the cost is, um, is something that, that families have to consider also, especially if they don't have all the different parts of Medicare to obtain the medication. I think it was very expensive uh, when it initially came out. And due to um, a lot of the doctors and companies saying, you know, we're paying this, this higher price for something that we're not sure if it works. And so those are the considerations that the family has to make, even if a doctor states that if you don't have the monies to pay for it, then you have to consider how the caregiver is going to deal with the situation. And like Scott was saying, the percentage of people, you're not, it's not going to improve it. It's just going to slow it down. And so that's a consideration that that's up to the family to make. Thank you. So I want to be respectful of everyone's time. There are dozens of more questions in the Q&A that we weren't able to get to, um, but this was very helpful. I know Dr. Moss had to sign off, but thank you to the two of you for participating. Thank you for everyone who joined us today. Um, there will be an email in about a week or two that you will receive that will have the link to the recording to share with anyone you'd like. We can also include some of the links that we've talked about today. And as I mentioned, um, if you do have questions you want us to follow up with the speakers on, our email is healthyagingseries at umich.edu. So thank you so much to the both of you, and I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Take care. Take care.